because many of you are here for the first time or maybe the first time in a while, let me just tell you, it won't be a lot, but you need to know we are looking at the Gospel of John with a special focus as we do so upon how John uses the Old Testament in his writing. John is the last gospel to be written. There is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those are called synoptic gospels because they all sort of say, tell the same stories, see things with, with maybe different emphasis, but it's the same basic narrative. And then along comes the gospel of John a few decades later. And the gospel of John is one that writes from a very different perspective. So as we get into the flow of today, what I'd like to start by doing is showing you a picture of the River Thames, spelled Thames because in England they don't know how to spell. But this is the River Thames, as we would spell it in Lubbock, it's just T-I-M-S, the River Thames. This river, if you've ever been to London, uh, this is a massive river. It's a thoroughfare. London was settled as a town during the Roman Empire days, actually settled before the time of Jesus. I think it was called Lugdunum back then, Lugdunum, but uh, uh, some Latin sounding name. But it's the same city that's there now, though obviously has grown not just expanded exponentially that way, but also up above where it was. And it was built originally as a community on the River Thames. I want to show you another picture of the River Thames, this massive, sprawling, wide river. There's the River Thames, if you see it, in Oxford, England. The River Thames spans a whole lot of this southern area of England. And on its way to the sea, it picks up tributaries along the way. And so there are other little streams and other little river systems that join in. And you can go to the River Thames. In fact, our son, when he was studying at Oxford, he and some buddies decided to spend two days rowing from Oxford to London. It took them two days. But they put in... In Oxford, in a crew boat that will take eight people to row, and they rowed all the way to London, 12 hours a day, two days, and finally in London, they are there. Now, why do I say this? Because in the Gospel of John, you've got, in essence, the River Thames, You've got this massive, huge gospel that runs wide, swift, and deep. But if you look at it carefully, you'll see it's made up of all of the waters from a number of different Old Testament streams of thought. And that's what makes this immense, marvelous gospel of John so special to study. That's what we're trying to focus on. Now, the Gospel of John is also a unique gospel from the other three in that it starts out with a prologue. A prologue is a section in the beginning that serves as an introduction. And unlike the other gospels that may have a pro-sentence, prologue sentence, like the gospel according to... You know, or some, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then they get right into it. John starts out with a whole different introduction. The first 18 verses of the book of John are part of what we can call a prologue or an introduction to what's going to come in the book. So if we're studying John, it's important as we're studying this introduction that we get in the flow of what it's trying to say. A lot of people think that John seems to be hopscotching between different subjects in his prologue, like he's not a coherent writer. But John isn't hopscotching between these different subjects. John has one subject in his prologue. It is the Word, capital W, Word, Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. 
he starts with that line. And for 18 verses, he's going to give us a prologue, an introduction that's built around the word. If you keep notes in this class or you want to put notes in your Bible and you want to outline the prologue, you could easily say the first two verses are where John writes about the Word and God. Verses 3 through 5, he writes about the Word and creation. Verses 6 through 8, what we dealt with last week, the Word and John the Baptist. Verses 9 through 14, what we'll deal with this week, the incarnation of the word. Incarnation means the word becoming flesh. And then the last section that we'll deal with next week, God willing, the greatness of the word. And that's verses 15 through 18. So if we look at John in this sense, that first section, the word and God begins, and this is it. These are the first two verses. In the beginning was the word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He, the Word, was in the beginning with God. And then John talks about the Word in creation. He says, all things were made through him. Again, a toe, we talked about it last week. And without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life. And the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. God said, let there be light. God separated the light from the darkness in creation. We find the light in Jesus, the word of God. So that's the second section of the prologue. The third section of the prologue is the word in John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. So that's the third section of the prologue. The fourth section of the prologue, what we're going to deal with today, is the incarnation of the word. Let's look at it together. The incarnation. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world. And the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word of God became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now that's the incarnation of the word section. If you look at it the way we're going to focus on it this morning, I want you to see three Old Testament roads that converge into this section of John. Three Old Testament roads. The first road is this. Jesus is the true light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. That's not a novel John concept. John wasn't sitting around with his pen in hand and his papyrus in front of him and thought, now, what analogy could I draw to put into my prologue so that this will become a best-selling gospel and maybe even make the big book? That's not the way it went down. John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, had recognized, as had the church, this Old Testament river of light talk that found expression in Jesus, the true light, the genuine light, aletheine is the, 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 the Greek word for true, 
the true, the genuine light. And we'll talk about that. The second is, Jesus is the rejected light. Jesus is rejected. The world did not know him. Not only, his own people did not receive him. This idea of the Messiah being rejected by his people and by the world is deeply embedded in the Old Testament prophetic words. And so we'll look at that in this passage as well. And the third thing we're going to look at this morning is how Jesus is the tabernacle. And that we'll find in the word became flesh and dwelt among us. But not only there, also in the phrase that, that we've seen his glory, glory as the only son from the father full of grace and truth. Now that's what we want to do in class. And as we look through this, what I urge you to do is not see John simply from an academic perspective. Don't get me wrong. The academia in me loves John. I mean, it's just like this beautiful academic expression that is so much fun to study simply from a head knowledge perspective. But if all we do is look at it to increase our head knowledge and say, mighty good writing, John, way to pull those Old Testament themes together then we haven't even begun to let the truth of this gospel change who we are. Each of these roads are significant to consider. The road of Jesus as the true light makes a difference in how I live today. Jesus as a, the rejected light makes a difference in how I live today. Jesus as the tabernacle makes a difference in how I live today. These make a difference in how I relate to God, not just know about God. And so I don't want you to simply walk away from today saying, cool stuff we learned in John. I want you to walk away from today saying, cool stuff we learned in John that changes the way I see my life and how I'm going to relate to God. You with me? All right, let's look at the first road that, that finds its way into John's gospel through the Old Testament. And that's Jesus as the true light. Now there are lots of Old Testament passages that we can use to, to, to emphasize the importance of what John's talking about. But I have pulled out a couple of them that I think must surely have been in John's mind because they seem to me so apparent in the way he echoes these words. Again, alethinos, this, this Greek word that, that, that's translated true, it means genuine, it means trustworthy, it can mean authentic, real, and Jesus really is the trustworthy, authentic, true light and know that when you read things like Psalm 27 or Psalm 36 or Isaiah 42. So those are the passages. We're going to see if the new Elmo works, which is not an Elmo. It's an Ipivo. And uh, the people in Ipivo have graciously sent us this for free so that we could see if we like it. I've tried it out before I got here. I like it a lot. Thank you, IPVO, for the free device to spread the word of God. Uh, okay. Now, what this also means is, is i got to figure out how to use it. But that's my fault, not IPVO's. Um, there we go. Let's get the lighting set on it. That we got light. See, this thing will do all sorts of things. All right. There we go. The look how crisp that is. Nothing personal, Elmo. Didn't used to be that way. <laughs> the Lord, the Yahweh. Yahweh. See, Lord is all capital letters. That means that we're looking at the Hebrew. 
Yahweh, yod Hey vav Hey, Yahweh. This is the name of God that's being used. This is the God who spoke to Moses from the bush. This is the God who led Israel out of Egypt. This is the God whose name should not be taken in vain. This is the name of the Lord that is to be praised. Yahweh is my light and my salvation. John wants you to know the true light, the true Yahweh, the true God, the Savior of Israel, the Savior of the world, the Messiah, the genuine, authentic, trustworthy, real deal. It's the Word of God, Jesus made flesh and dwelt among us. He is our salvation. I'm telling you this changes the way I live because it should. When Yahweh, when Jesus is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? Now, if I'm my light and salvation, I got a lot to fear. I love my sweet life, wife, Becky. But if she were my light and my salvation, with all due respect, honey, I'd still have some things to fear. But if Jesus, who so loves the world that he will come from on high, and be made flesh, and be humiliated by humanity, and spurned and rejected, and die for my sins, so that I can have a relationship. He cares that much for me to have an eternal walk with him, that he will do that for me honestly. What do I have to fear? He's my light and my salvation. When evildoers assail me, to eat up my flesh, they're the ones who will stumble and fall. They're in darkness. I'm in light. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. War arise against me. I will be confident. Why? Look at this. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. One thing. I have asked of the Lord. One thing I have asked of Yahweh. That one thing I'm going to seek after. That I may dwell in the house of Yahweh all the days of my life. To gaze upon the beauty of Yahweh and to inquire. Word also means meditate. Meditate. In his temple. You remember Tevye's line in Fiddler on the Roof? In the song, If I Were a Rich Man? Yebba deba deba yebba deba 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 dum. <laughs> All day long I'd pit a pit a pum. If I were a wealthy man, wouldn't have to work hard. Yebba deba deba yebba deba 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 dum. If I were an itty bitty rich, I'd lead a lot of dum. I'd have the time that I like to sit in the synagogue and pray and maybe have a seat by the western wall, eastern wall, one of the walls. And I discuss the holy books with the learned men and that would be the sweetest gift of all. Yeah, this, this is the one thing to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire and meditate in his temple. God has given us that in Jesus. And John does not want his readers to miss it. This is the prologue. This is the introduction. This is why we want to study the gospel because the gospel pages are going to open it up. In these gospel pages, Jesus is going to declare, I am the light of the world. 
And we are going to see Jesus explain this passage as we walk through the gospel. So as part of the introduction, you need to read it and you need to see that psalm. Let's look at Psalm 36 real quick. No? Well, okay. And we don't have time to go through all of these, and I want to make sure I've got time to get to the end stuff. So let's do this quickly. This is one to take home. Take home and read Psalm 36. You'll want to focus on these passages about the steadfast love of God. Here it is, verse 5. Your steadfast love endures forever, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast you save, O God. How precious is your steadfast love. The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Feast on the abundance of your house. Drink from the river of your delights. For with you is the fountain of life in your light. Do we see light? Jesus is the genuine, authentic, reliable, trustworthy, real light. And in his light, we see light. You gaze upon Jesus and you'll know what's what. You got an ethical quandary? Gaze upon Jesus and you'll know what to do. You got a mix up in your life? Gaze upon Jesus. And let him untangle your knots. You burdened with guilt and shame and humiliation because of bad choices and sin. Take him to the foot of Jesus' cross. And let him wash you clean, white as snow. And then walk away from the shame knowing it's no longer yours. Because you're free in the name of Jesus. That's what you've got here. Look at Isaiah 42, 16. What a passage. What a passage for the light. Isaiah 42, 16. This is talking about Jesus coming, the Messiah. Uh, let's get a run and go. I will lay waste mountains and hills, dry up vegetation, turn rivers into islands, dry up the pools. I will lead the blind in a way they don't know. In paths they've not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. A lot of people think he's talking there um, about Lubbock, Texas. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They're turned back and utterly put to shame, who trust in carved idols, metal images, and say, oh, you're my God. Oh, look, the God of water. Hello, you are my God. Oh, the God of spectacles. Um, you heard about the lens grinder who fell into the glasses thing, made a spectacle of himself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay anyway these are the passages Jesus as the light why is light a marvelous image of what he does because when we are in the light we see things make sense we have find safety in the light you don't Worry about tripping over something in the dark if you're in the light. So if we go back to the PowerPoint, Jesus is the true light. That's one Old Testament road, but there's a second Old Testament road I want us to look at. Jesus as the rejected light. He is the light, but he is a rejected light. I want us to look at Isaiah 2, 1 through 5, and I want us to look at Isaiah 8, 14, and 15 in this regard. Isaiah 2, 1 through 5. Ah, 
there we go. Isaiah 2. The word of the Lord. The word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. It shall come to pass in the latter days. By the way, biblically, we are in the latter or last days now. The last days started with the resurrection of Jesus. We've been in the last days ever since. And we don't know which time, which day, which hour. But these are the last days. It will come to an end after these. It'll come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established. It's the highest of the mountains. It'll be lifted up above the hills. All the nations shall flow to it. And many people shall come and say, let's go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go the law, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he will judge the... We can't pass over these concepts that John is using. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. Through the Word, everything was made. And the Word is the true light, the authentic light. He's still talking about the Word. The Word of the Lord that's coming from Zion, that's coming from Jerusalem, and He shall judge between the nations. He shall decide disputes for many people and they'll beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. I'm not after trying to bludgeon you to death. I'm after trying to feed you and lead you and minister to you. Nations, not supposed to be lifting up sword against nation. Oh, house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. Let us walk as people of the light. We've got some horrible social problems. We've got them in our world. My son was telling me some more details about what was going on in India this morning. It's a horrible situation. What's going on in, in, in places in the East with religious persecution is horrendous. But we've got horrible situations a lot closer to home. We've got some people who are desperate to try to find, and these are our neighbors, who are desperate to find a place of safety, a place where they can work and feed their families. We've got them closer than that. We've got people in this room who are hurting, who desperately need help. And the light that shines in the darkness is not a light that should be rejected. It's a light that should cause us to take what we've got and turn it into things that will help others as we walk in the light of the Lord. That, that, that passage in Isaiah is a setup for the other passage in Isaiah, Isaiah 8, 14 and 15. I want you to look at that one with me real quick. Isaiah 8, 14 and 15. Ah, there we go. The Lord of hosts, I'm starting in verse 13. Him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And he will become sanctuary and a stone of offense and a rock of stumbling to both houses of Israel, northern kingdom, southern kingdom. A trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many shall stumble on it. They'll fall and be broken. They'll be snared and taken. The light of the Lord is one that was going to be rejected. Now, as Isaiah wrote this, Isaiah's concern was not simply the Messiah. 
we used this map recently in another series I was teaching in here. Isaiah's context is this. If we consider Israel that circle, it's northern kingdom and southern kingdom. We know that up at the top are the Assyrian Empire at the time of Isaiah's prophecies. We know down in the bottom is the Egyptian Empire at the time as well. And what Isaiah is saying is that in the process of his prophetic word, and we're in the 700 BCE range, he's saying that what's going to happen here is the Assyrian king, Shalmaneser, is going to come down and dance all over Israel. The northern kingdom, he's just going to take them and destroy them. And he's going to have his way with them. But there's going to be in the latter days, God, God's not through with them. It's not over. They will survive. And in the latter days, God's going to raise up one, a mountain higher than all the others, who's going to draw people from all nations to him. As opposed to Shalmaneser, who's going to come down and conquer and then die, this will be one to whom everyone comes and the law of the Lord will flow forth and the light will come. But the problem is a lot of people are going to stumble upon it. They're, they're going to reject it. And what Isaiah has done here is give us a snapshot at God's tapestry that he's weaving in history. And God, the people chose to rebel against God. The people, Shalmaneser chose to come down and he came down in judgment. All of those were actions of people. The prophets warned Israel, stop it or this is going to happen. The people did it anyway. But out of all of that problem, out of everybody getting to pick which color they want to be, God weaved his tapestry to get his will done. And that's an amazing thing. So there is a rejection of Jesus that takes place by a lot of people. It's almost silly to say, I choose to live in the darkness instead of the light. But that's a real thing that happens. If within the framework, God still gets his tapestry made. Third and final road, Jesus, his tabernacle. To understand this, we need to understand the tabernacle. So make sure we're all on the same page. For four centuries, 400 years, Israel has been in Egypt. They've syncretized the Egyptian religion. They've become, they're still their own people. They've still got ties. They still know who they are. They're still the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But in the midst of all of that, they've become a people without a devoted following of the Lord. And God comes in and he says, I promised Abraham, and it's all part of my covenant responsibility that I'm faithful for to all generations, that through the seed of Abraham and through these people is going to come one who's going to set right the problems of Eden and the sin of humanity. And so I'm going to preserve this line. I'm going to preserve their claim to the land. These, this is a promise I made to Abraham, and I will keep it. So God brings the people out of Egypt. Now in Egypt, everywhere you go, you've got a God. They had thousands of gods. They had the God of the Nile. They had the God of, you know, Gebs, the God of the dirt. Uh, Nuts, the God of the firmament and the sky. You know, they've got Shu, who's the God of air. Ra, who's the God of the sun. They had gods for everything. And God's everywhere. And God calls Moses and he calls those people out and he takes them to Sinai. And he says, the real God's too holy for you to see. The real God doesn't dwell in the Nile. Doesn't dwell in the land. Doesn't dwell in the sun. The real God is the God of all. 
who can pronounce judgment on the Nile. Judgment, darken the sun, turn the Nile into blood. Who can perform all of these miracles that, that show great superiority to any Egyptian god there is. This isn't a God restricted to a country, restricted to a nation, restricted to a people. This is the God of everybody. He can go wherever he wants to go because he's everywhere. And it's a total different understanding of God than the people had. And God tells Moses, he says, I want you, I'm going to gift certain people with certain skills, and I want them to make exactly the way I tell you this tabernacle, this tent. And there's going to be an altar for offering sacrifices. I'm going to give you the dimensions. I'm going to tell you how to make the, the fence to go around it because people can't just wander in. Only the holy priests. And I'm going to lay all of this stuff out for you because I'm going to meet you at the tabernacle. And so they build it. And they do all of this elaborate work. And then we read in Exodus 40, the cloud, the cloud covered the tabernacle, the tent of meeting where God was going to meet the people. And the glory of the Lord filled the tent. And Moses couldn't enter the tent because the cloud was on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? I mean, seriously. The, the, the Greek version of the Old Testament that was in use at the time John wrote his gospel. Uh, in the Mediterranean world, most of the Jews couldn't read Hebrew anymore. And so they, they, they read Greek there's a word for the tabernacle. Let's see if I can. There we go. So the word for tabernacle or tent. And we can get a little bigger. I got a toy. Word for tabernacle or tent in Greek it's, um, this is S-C, a long E, skeno-o. Um, we get, let me put it into English letters. We get basically this word from it, scene. It means to pitch a tent in the verb as it's used here. And why do you pitch a tent? If you're a nomadic people, because that's where you're going to live for a while. You pitch a tent to dwell. This means dwell. Okay? So, this passage that John writes, if we go back to the PowerPoint, where John says the, the, the word became flesh, and dwelt among us, John's using the word that's used over 30 times in Exodus and beyond for the tabernacle. Jesus is the true place where God meets his people. God descends to earth not just as a cloud in some tent, that was a foreshadowing. That was a forecasting. That's a tributary to the big river of the reality of what God would do in Jesus. This is why Jesus can so easily say, Moses wrote about me. This is why we see Jesus saying, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came the Torah. I came to fulfill the Torah. This is the word became flesh and it became the tabernacle, the meeting place. The huge part of this is when we understand that it's not one any longer where, well, gee, we can't come to Jesus because no, it's no longer restricted the way the tabernacle was. He's going to draw all nations to himself. 
He wants everybody into the tent of meeting. It's not an exclusive club. If you go back to the Exodus story, there's more to it too. Because in the Exodus story, you know, Zechariah 2.11 had promised this, by the way. Zechariah 2.11, God said, I will dwell, I will dwell, I will tabernacle in your midst. Mishkan is the Hebrew word for tabernacle. I will tabernacle in your midst and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. This is not, I mean, there's like neon lights around Jesus here, guys. This is something that there's a reason at the incarnation, at the birth of Jesus, the angels are rejoicing and singing. And heaven is rejoicing. This is the culmination of plans that God made before he created this world. He created this world, he created humanity, knowing what it would cost him to give us free will for him to win us back and redeem our souls and our lives. And so he's known it. He's had no trouble talking about it all this time ahead of time. I will dwell in your midst. You're going to know I, that, that the Lord, and it's Yahweh there. I should have put it in all capitals. Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. He continues, Exodus 33, 18 through 23. I've just barely got time. Exodus 33, 18 through 23. We need to see this. Exodus 33, 18 through 23. Moses gets his wish list out with God. God says, you know, Moses, what can I do for you? Moses says, please show me your glory. God says, I'm going to make all my goodness pass before you and you'll proclaim and, and I'll proclaim to you my name, Yahweh. And I'm going to be gracious to whom I'm going to be gracious. I'm going to show mercy on whom I'm going to show mercy. I'm going to be who I am. So I'm going to declare my, my goodness is going to pass before you. I'm going to pronounce my name to you. I'm going to be who I am to you. But you can't see my face. No man can see me and live. So the Lord says, there's a place by me where you'll stand on the rock and while my glory passes by, I'll put you in a cleft in the rock and I'll cover you with my hand until I've passed by. Then I'll take away my hand and you'll see my back, but you can't see my face. You can't see my glory. Moses, no man was fit to see the glory of God in that condition. But this is what John says we have now seen when God becomes human. The wish of Moses has been granted. John says, the word became flesh and tabernacled among us and we have seen his glory. Moses said, I want to see your glory. God says, you can't see my glory and live. No man can. Unless God becomes flesh, which he did in Jesus. And now in Jesus, we've seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father. Full of grace and truth. And if we don't read that, in this section of the prologue, we're missing out tremendously. And John's prologue should not only change the way we live as we see these tributaries running into a river. It not only should change the way we live. It not only should change what we watch, what we, how we treat people, how we... Um, choose to invest our time and our energy and our resources. 
it not only should change everything we do day to day, minute by minute, but it ought to also whet our appetite to read more of his gospel. Because this is just the introduction. This is just the prologue. This gospel blows my doors away. Here's your take home for the day. Jesus is the light of the world. The true light, the genuine light was coming into the world. I don't need to walk in darkness. I don't need to fear the darkness. I know where I need to go for my answers. I need to know, I know where I need to go for my insight. And it means I need to spend time in the Word. It means I need to spend time in prayer. But it also means I need to spend time with the body of Christ. This is what Pastor David was talking about this morning on our need to connect. Because you're Jesus. He dwells in you. I need the light from being around my brothers and sisters. As well as from reading. As well as from prayer and meditation. Jesus is the light of the world. And I want to walk in that light. I do not want to be one of the rejectors. That Isaiah passage is quoted by Paul in Romans 9, 30 through 33. Where Paul talks about the fact that when Isaiah was writing about people who would stumble upon the gospel is what he's talking about. People who, who see Jesus. And some people see it and they just don't believe it. Well, those people need to think through things better. Some people see it and they think, well, I don't need it. I, don't, I had a dream about this last night. This is one of these things that just occurs to me. I'd forgotten this dream. I was talking to someone said, I don't need Jesus. I don't need the death of Jesus for my sins. And I just said, well, what are you doing with your sin? You think God just ignores it? He doesn't care? It's inconsequential? You have such an unjust God that no big deal. And God is a just God. He can't change that. Something's got to be done with the sin. And so those people who just say, well, Jesus died, I don't need that. I'm sitting there thinking, well, buddy, you do too. And then some people will see Jesus and think well, that's just a bunch of foolery. I mean, who's to think that there's a God who would care that much? Surely it's a myth. Well, no, there's a God who cares that much. And if there's not, then we're all in darkness. We just are pretending we got a flashlight maybe. But I mean, look, if there's no Jesus dying for my sins and this whole thing's a myth... I'm going to be a nihilist. There's no, uh, uh, just, you, you want to see dark, I'll go full emo on you. I'm going to paint my fingernails black, paint my toenails black. But I'm not going to. I will behold his glory instead. Because we've seen his glory. Glory is the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. This is something worth investing your whole life on because you're investing your death on it. But Jesus doesn't just matter to me when I'm dead. He matters to me right now, today. He matters to me for everyone that I love and care for. And he matters to me for you. So these are the roads that converge, and these roads converge. And I'm excited to finish the prologue next Sunday so that we can actually trace these roads with great detail and thoroughness as we work through the book. Can I bless you? And we'll leave. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask your blessings on all who hear this message, that your light will shine in their lives, 
that they will receive your light, embrace your light, walk in your light, trust your light, and behold the glory of you, our God and Father, expressed through Jesus, your Son, in whom we pray, amen. Amen.